so let's go ahead and get started here with the the uh, opening the downloaded files. So um, I'm just going to show this in case if no one's uh, or if someone has not opened like a .r file before, right? So what you do is you just come over here, you hit download, and it'll download it. Now I've already got it set up so that all the .r files are opened automatically in our studio. But if you don't have it like that, you can just come over here. Uh, this is, I guess, for the Windows people. Um, show in folder, and I can say, um, you know, uh, open with, and R Studio should come up here. If it doesn't, the other way you can do this is you can go into R Studio, and then you can just do Control O, or open, and then you can find the file you're trying to open. So, uh, does that make sense? Okay, great, great. So, if you'll recall, uh, the first topic that we went over was these simple data structures. Uh, now, I'm going to do this in R Studio because I think it'd be really instructive for you to see how I interact. You know how I interact with the R code. Uh, when I'm in this interface. So if I want to run a line of R code, all I do is I hit control enter. And what that does, and I, so for the Mac people, that would probably be command enter. And what that does is that uh, takes the code on that line and it puts it into the console and it runs it. So that would be the equivalent of me copying and pasting this line of code into my console and hitting enter. Okay, so the first uh, data structure that we talked about in R was numerics. Now, numerics can be integers, whole numbers, uh, like one, two, three, that sort of thing. Um, they can uh, follow this sort of scientific notation, which in this case, this would be one times 10 to the hundredth, or they can be decimal numbers, or what we would call in R, we would call these doubles. Um, they're all a kind of numeric, but integers and doubles are different. We, we don't really need to know the difference um, unless you're doing some, some kind of hardcore coding uh, because R will actually take care of it for you. If something needs to be an integer, typically it'll make it an integer. If something needs to be a double, it'll make it a double without you having to deal with it yourself. So when I run this um, by hitting Control Enter or Command Enter if you're a Mac user, this shows me one, one times 10 to the hundredth, and 1.1. 1 .1. Okay, so the next data type was logicals. These can either be true or false. Um, and really they're quite simple. They're, they're what we would call a binary data structure because they can only be one of two things. So when I put that into the console, it gives me back true. This one gives me back false. Characters are between quotation marks. So you can have double quotation marks or single quotation marks, but it's, it's any string of words or numbers or symbols that's between these quotations. So when I run this, it prints me back the message, hello world. This one prints back, this is a string. So hopefully you guys are able to run this interactively as I'm doing this. You're able to run this in your R Studio. Um, if anyone's still having trouble with that, uh, please you know put it in the chat. Hopefully the the TAs will be able to uh, figure it out. But I think it would be really good if everyone got a little bit of practice doing this along with me here in R Studio. All right. So there are some methods that you can use on simple data structures. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the class method. So class is a method, or in other words, it's a function that we can use to determine the class of any R object. So like we talked about before, we've got, you know, numerics, logicals, and characters. So if I type class of hello world, it prints back to me character. 
because that's the class of that string. Class of one gives back numeric. Class of true gives back logical. Class is really useful, but sometimes we want to know more about our data objects. So that's where the structure command is very handy. So structure or str is a method that allows you to not just see the class of an object, but also to take a, a sneak peek at the data that's in that object. So when I do str of hello world, we can see here it gives back to me, it's a character, so that's the class, and then it tells me what is contained in the object. Okay. Um, Muku says that some people can't get this, uh, are not able to get this file. If you're experiencing that issue, can you unmute and say what's, uh, if you're having that problem? Okay. Henry, could you just once again, just quickly clarify between the class function and the structure? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so the class function is just going to tell you the class of an object. Um, this, so if, for example, if we're talking about lists, which we're gonna get back to in a second. So if I make an empty list here, my list. So I've now made this empty list called my list. And when I print it, I can see that it's an empty list. When I look at the class of my list, it tells me that it is a list. But instead, if I looked at the structure of my list, it would tell me, uh, oh, I guess that's not, that's not the best example. Let me put something in here, actually. I'll, I'll put, um, I'll put uh, A and B, I'll put a vector, I'll put a, a number, and I'll put a Boolean or a logical, depending on who you're talking to. So let's, let's make it not an empty list. So if I do, again, if I do the class of my list, it's a list. If I do the structure of my list, now it tells me a lot more information. It tells me it's a list, so it gives me the class, a list of three, so it's got three elements in it. And then it tells me for each of those elements, what is their class and what do they contain? So it tells me this first element, which is my vector, is a character class of length two, and it contains these two elements. The second thing, which is a numeric, that's this one here, is a numeric and it contains the value one. And then the third is a logical, that's this one here, and it contains the value true. So while, while class it, it, you know, is giving the overall class of the object that I put into it, structure not only gives the class, but it also gives a lot more information about what's contained within that object. So structure ultimately can be quite a bit more useful um, in many cases. Does that answer your question, Saif? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. All right, uh, so we talked before about some arithmetic with R. Um, so, you know, in its most basic form, R can just be used as a, a calculator. Um, so, you know, in this case, we're doing addition, one plus one. You know, we get the result two. One minus one is zero. Two times five, so now we're doing multiplication, is 10. Two, uh, 10 divided by five is two. And now um, this is exponentiation. So this is two raised to the power of three. So two raised to the power of three is eight. And this one, uh, we didn't really get too much into in the lecture, but hopefully you guys did the, uh, the introduction to our course in Datacamp and you kind of at least heard the term modulo before. But that's what this is, it's the modulo operator. And it does division and gives you back the remainder. So, it's not going to return the result of the division, it's only going to return the remainder of that division. So nine divided by three, well, 
that gives a modulo of zero because nine is evenly divided by three. But for example, if we put 10 divided by three, the modulo gives back one. And that's because when you divide 10 by three, you have a remainder of one. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, can anyone tell me what the modulo of 14 divided by 3 is? So what would what would this give me? Yeah, all right. So yeah, Juwan and, and Adiri all got it real quick. So, yeah, okay. All right, you guys got it. It's okay, Joel. I, would, I, I knew what you meant. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, McKenna asked... Isn't the double um, percent sign also used for is divisible by? So is divisible by, so, um, so modulo is asking that question to some degree. It's asking, is it divisible by this thing? And it'll give you a zero if it's fully divisible, but it'll give you a remainder if it's not fully divisible. Hopefully that kind of answers your question. Okay. All right, so this indeed does give a two. So let's talk about some logical operations. Um, I don't think we actually went through this the first time, but this uh, exclamation point, really anytime you see this in R or pretty much in any programming language, an exclamation point usually means not. So this is equivalent to saying not true. So when I say not true, I get false. When I say not false, I get true. Um, now, this is something that we probably also didn't talk about. This is the and symbol, right? So if anyone's familiar with formal logic, basically both sides of this have to be true for this entire statement to be true, right? And the reason is because this would be true and false right now, which means it's not both of these, it's only one of them. Um, does that, I guess, does that actually make sense? Do you, have you, do you guys understand kind of what that, um, I, I've, my, my background is actually partially in formal logic, so this seems really straightforward to me, but I think it was probably pretty confusing at first. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, I'm like hesitating to uh, pull up a picture of a truth table, if anyone knows what that is. Um, but basically, yeah, I'll just pull up a picture of a truth table. All right. So this is an example of a truth table. If you've ever taken a formal logic class, you will be probably pretty familiar with it. Um, and hopefully they'll give me a nice high quality image here that I can show. Of course they didn't. Um, we'll, do, we'll do this one. This one's pretty good. Um, okay. So I guess we should use, so the problem is I guess here that this is, this is actually the, um, full, this is the logic way to say not. So it's not an exclamation point. Did you go to the store? Yeah, actually, uh, Nikhil has a really good example in the chat. So let's go. Let's just go back to that because I don't want to confuse the terminology. Um, so did or sorry, I put that backwards. Did you go to store? So let's say I did go to the store. So let's say uh, it says went to store, bought cheese. So now I want to ask a question. Let's say, let's say that I'm talking to like my roommate, right? And I ask them, did you go to the store and did you buy cheese, right? So I'm asking them a question. And the question I'm asking is, did you go to the store and did you by cheese. And let me say this, I probably said that backwards here. Did you go to the store and buy cheese? 
And so the truth is this, this question is either yes or no, right? It's only yes if they both went to the store and bought cheese. So the way I ask that question in R is went to store and bought cheese. So if they both went to the store and bought cheese, this will be true, which it is. But let's say that they didn't buy cheese. They forgot, they forgot to buy the cheese. So if I ask them uh, this question, did you go to the store and buy cheese? Well, now we know that actually the answer to this one question is no, they didn't do that. So in this case, it's false. So that's what the and means. It's basically asking a question like this. Did you have this side of the and and this side of the and equal to true? And if one of these sides is false, if one of these things is false, then the entire statement, the entire statement within these parentheses would be false. But if both of these are true, then the entire statement is true. And if I change this to true, then the whole thing is true. All right, um, does that, Adiri, does that make sense? Yeah, um, I guess my question on the logical operator was kind of more on the vertical line, like when do you use that and how, isn't that, doesn't that mean or something like that, but they used it in data camp kind of, to me in a confusing way, because it was kind of like what you were doing with the, with the go to the store for cheese, but then they put that, I think it's called an ampersand or whatever it's called, and it was like, validating two different statements. I just didn't know when to use it or when not to use it. Sure, so let's, let's say this. Let's say I want to ask someone the question, did you go to the store or buy cheese? Well, that's when I would use the or sign, but actually this phrase doesn't really make a lot of semantic sense. Um, did you get up on time or um, take the bus? So let's say that like I carpool with someone, right? Or um, I, my roommate carpools with someone. And so I know that if they don't get up on time, then they'll typically have to take the bus, right? So let's say that up on time was false. So they took the bus, true. So in this case, I'm just gonna replace these with my new values, up on time or took the bus, because we expect this to be one or the other, right? So I'll, I'll get back to this in a minute as to, to what I mean by that specifically in R, but up on time or took the bus. And we know that this is actually true because at least one of these two was true. And it's semantically, you can understand this because the, the question I asked my roommate, did you get up on time or take the bus? Well, we know that, you know, they didn't get up on time, but they did take the bus. So that means that the answer to my question is yes or true, which is why when I ask that question here in R, the answer is true. Okay. Now, the only way to make this false is if both of these are false. Because that would be my, me asking them, did you get up on time or take the bus? If they didn't do either, then we know that my question, the answer to my question would be no or false. Okay. Um, all right, does anybody, uh, does this kind of make sense? Does anybody have any other questions or want to go through this anymore? 
Like I could do another example if that would help. Okay, all right, I'll do one more example. It's probably worthwhile to notice that you can actually nest these statements within each other. So let's make kind of a more complicated statement. Um, did you get home on time? Um, let's say actually this, let's say, did you get flowers or bread? Did you get flowers or bread? And then um, let's actually say, did you get flowers and potatoes or bread? So in this particular case, we can already see here, this is probably a conversation you never really have in reality with a, a real human person, um, but we've actually set up another logical statement. And now we have a nested condition within that statement. So the bigger statement is the or statement. So we can actually draw some nice parentheses in here to show this off. So the whole thing, you know, my question to my roommate is an or statement at the highest level here. So this would be, you know, flowers and potatoes on the left side. And bread on the right side. But I can actually represent flowers and potatoes as flowers and potatoes. So let's say that I did get flowers, so that's true. Uh, I didn't get potatoes, so potatoes is actually false. And I didn't get bread. Can anyone tell me what this will evaluate to when I run it? False. Good. Um, so uh, I'll get, Simon, I'll get to your question in a second. That's, that's a great question though. So yeah, it evaluates to false. And that's because this side of the or statement was false. So that meant that the whole thing has to be false unless this side is true. But for this side to be true, you had to have flowers true and potatoes true. But because potatoes is false, then this side is also false. Therefore, both sides are false. And now the whole thing is false. Can anyone tell me what would happen if I put the uh, exclamation point in front of bread? Would the whole thing now be false or would it be true? Okay, Saif says false. Okay, some other people said true. Yeah, it would be true. And that's because bread is false. But when you put the exclamation point in front of bread, now it becomes true. And therefore, at least one of my two sides of the or statement is now true. So now the whole thing is true. And so uh, Simon asked a really good question earlier, and that was, does R evaluate logical statements left to right or right to left without parentheses? Um, so that's a, con <laughs> it's a little bit of a complicated question for a reason that I purposefully did not go into, but there is such a thing in R as a double and and a double or which you might see in other coding languages. For the sake of time, I don't wanna get into these right now. Uh, I would say if you're, if you're interested in that, uh, I would look them up and, and see, see what those are. We'll, get into, we'll probably have to get into that at some point, but for right now, I don't really wanna get into it because uh, basically when you have the single ampersand or the single uh, or, that means that it's going to evaluate both sides of your equation both sides of the statement. Uh, but if, for example, so let me, let me chain another thing on here. 
So now this is not a logical, is it? It's going to give me an error because right here I see it says operations are possible only for numeric, logical, or complex types. A character is not logical. It's a character. So this and you know statement here doesn't actually make any logical sense. Now I'm going to put instead of a single and I'm going to put double ands. So this time I didn't get an error. The reason is because when you use a double and it goes strictly in order from left to right. It goes, it evaluates this one first. And then if this one is true, then it evaluates this one. If this one, only if this one is also true, will it go on to evaluate this and then throw the error. Because we didn't get an error, we know that it stopped after only evaluating these two. And it never went on to this third part. So hopefully that makes sense. It goes strictly in order when you use these double ampersands or double or signs. So I can show you the equivalent situation here with double or. Um, now, if this is false and then this is true, we know what's going to happen is it's going to start here. It's going to say, okay, that was false. And then it's gonna say, but maybe this is true. And then it is true, so then it can just stop right here because now the whole thing is true because you had at least one true in your or statement. But if this is also false, then now it's going to say, well, okay, what about the last thing? And then now it's going to hit the error because we've, we've made it all the way to the uh, illogical part of our statement. So the difference here being that even if I have true and true, uh, or sorry, I should put this the other way. Even if I have true and false and hello world, if I don't have the double ampersands, then it's going to throw the error at me because it evaluates all three parts of this uh, at once. It doesn't do it in order, it just does them all. But this is actually okay. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, does that answer your question, Simon? Okay. Uh, the parentheses are good for uh, making sure that it does it in the right. So when you're not using these ampersands or anything like that, when, when you want to control the order in which things are evaluated, uh, the, the parentheses are always a nice way to do that. I personally like to use them um, simply because it, it makes it a lot clearer, the order of operations, uh, whether that's mathematical or logical operations, what have you. Okay, so moving on. So we have some comparisons that you can do with, um, with the different data types, the different simple data types. So uh, one equal to one, this is just an equivalence comparison. If, if one is equal to one, you know, if this entire statement evaluates to true, um, then that means that the left side and the right side were the same. So they are, one is equal to one. So this whole assertion here evaluates to true. This is just like before. This is really all one question. And the question is, is one equal to one? And then if the answer is yes, it returns true. If the answer is no, it returns false but it's true. We can do the same thing with, um, you know, with characters. We can say hello equal to world. And we know that these things aren't equal, so this should return false. And it does. So we could also ask if something is not equal. 
So the way you do that in R is you put the exclamation point equals one. So this means one not equal to one, but we actually know that they are equal, so this should give us false. Now, if instead I had changed this to 10, would it give me true or false? You guys can, yeah, all right, good, good. Okay, good, yeah, in fact, it would be true now because 10 is not equal to one. So these comparisons greater than, less than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to are really just for numbers. I mean, to tell you the truth, you can actually do them on other data types but it doesn't really make any sense when you do it. And I would really recommend you to never try that. Um, well, I mean, you can try it, but like never use it as part of any sort of serious analysis. Uh, Victor asks, does this, is this the same thing as this? And I'm pretty sure this isn't anything. Well, actually, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, so no, that's not anything. So it does have to be uh, exclamation point equals. All right, so here we're asking another logical question. We're asking is 10 greater than one? If the answer is yes, it should be true. If the answer is no, it should be false. But 10 is greater than one, so it was true. So, I mean, this is pretty simple now. Is, one, is 10 less than 100, which it is, so that's true. Is two less than or equal to two? Well, it's equal, so true. And then is five greater than or equal to three? Which it is, so that's also true. All right, so before we move on to the more complex data structures, are there any questions? Okay, so I'm sure you all recall variables. Um, you assign values to variables. Variables hold R objects within them. So A is being assigned the R object one. B is being assigned the, you know, the object two. And then because these are both numbers, we can perform you know, mathematical operations on them. So we do A plus B and we know that should be Three. The other thing about variables is that they can have names. So if I assign to A, you know, looking here, A, if I assign A the name, hello world, A now has the name, hello world, and the value one. It doesn't change the value, it only changes the name. So uh, those are variables. We're going to use those all the time when we're working in R, because you know you need to um, have a way of abstracting some of the more complex parts of your code, and that's a good way to do it. So let's talk about vectors. Vectors can contain numerics, characters, or logicals. They are an ordered collection of those objects. They can be infinitely long. Um, they could be, you know, only one. You know, vectors can really be quite versatile in R. So when we run this code, we get one, two, three, because that's what the vector contains. This gives us hello world exclamation point, because that's the characters the vector contains. And this gives us true, false, false because that's what the logical vector contains. You can also make a numeric vector um, using this shorthand notation. This basically means all of the whole numbers between one and 10. So when I put that into a vector and save it to a variable, when I print that variable, I can see it contains all the numbers between one to 10. So uh, vectors can have names. I think we've already covered that pretty well at this point. So I, I make my vector, I assign it some names, 
And now we can see that I have a named vector. You can access elements of a, ve of a vector using indices. So in this case, uh, I'm using the index one, and that basically means that I want the first element from that vector. So can anyone tell me what this will give? Okay, good, good. So yeah, it, it does give one, but it also, I mean, the one has the name hello. So it gives you back one, but it's got the name hello, because that was the name we assigned to that element of the vector. All right, so we can also use vectors to access vectors. So this is the vector one, two, we type this in here we can see it's it's a vector containing the numbers one and two and so basically what this means here is that we're getting the first and second element from this vector here hello and world we can also access elements of a vector using their name all right so um, the next step is the data frames. So here we're defining a data frame. It contains uh, three vectors. These are the three columns of the data frame. And these columns have names. So this first column is called numerics. The second is called characters. And the third is called logicals. So when I define this, and then I take a look at it, I can see here my three columns containing the three vectors of data that they hold. So as we kind of have pointed out before, uh, data frames can have row names and column names. So I'm going to define here some row names for my data frame. And I'm going to define some column names for my data frame. Then when I print my data frame, I can now see the column names have changed to what I set the mass, and the row names have been added. Something else that you can do when you're in RStudio is you can type this view, uppercase V, view command to actually view a data frame. So that would be probably one of the most useful commands that you get with RStudio. Uh, the ability to just very easily interact with your data. See, I can even change the order of the columns. I can filter it. I can search it. Um, it's a really pretty powerful feature, to be honest with you. All right. So that's how you do that, the view command. The other way to do it, uh, which, you know, I don't have this open right now, but if you're in, um, if I show all my panes over here, I can see over here in my environment panel, I can see my data frame over here. If I just click on this, it'll open it up. So that's the other way. Just click on it, it'll open it up. And you can see when I do that, it's actually, it's typing that view command down here. And the reason is because the clicking action is just a shortcut for typing view my DF into the console. So, all right, uh, data frames can be accessed um, by row and column. So this would be the notation. This would be row one, column two. So that gives me hello. So I can see this here. Row one, column two is in fact, hello. Row, uh, well, this would be row two. Whoops. Row two, column one. We can see that here. Yeah, I'm just going to, uh, row three, and this is going to return all the columns because I didn't put a number in here. That means I'm returning all the columns. So I can see I got row three and I got the value for each of the columns in row three. 
And if instead I specified a column but no rows, well then I would return all the rows in that column. So I'm gonna return here all the rows in column two. And so I can see I get hello world exclamation point. And if I look over here, column two, hello world exclamation point, it's the same. Okay, so you can also, you can also access uh, data frames using the row and column names. So because I have column names and row names, I can, just like with vectors, I can use those names to access the data elements. So in this case, I'm accessing row one using the name row one and column two. So same as before. And then I'm accessing row one, column three, like this. And, you know, so on and so forth. You can mix and match these as much as you like. Uh, the other way, and probably the most common way that everyone's going to access data in a data frame is the uh, dollar sign notation. So that returns an entire column of a data frame as a vector. So if I look at call one of my DF, I can see here, it returns it as a vector. That's one, two, three. And then I can get the second element of that vector. So let's say I wanted uh, column two, row two. A way I could get that is by taking the entirety of column two as a vector and then just selecting the second element from it. So, that's column two, row two, world. All right. So uh, lists. So I think uh, at this point, we pretty much covered all the basic elements of how to work with data in R. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster now unless, unless anybody has a question, um, but okay. So lists are similar to vectors, except they can store anything. They're ordered collections of any R object. So they can store numerics, characters, logicals, they can even store vectors, they can even store, you know, I could even store another list in here and that will still work. When I print this, I can see it here. I can see the first element was my one, A, true, my vector, and then here's the list that I put in. So it's, it's now a nested list, which is why it looks like this. If you want to really easily see the, uh, the structure of your list, you could type str my list. And we can see it here. The other way is to simply type, uh, is to simply view it in our studio. So if I click on this, I can actually interactively explore my list. I can, I can, anything that's nested, I can actually open that up and see what's inside of it. And if I want to return a specific element of this list, I can just click on this right here and it'll give me that element of the list. Pretty handy. So uh, similar to vectors, lists, have names. Um, so, so I'm gonna get rid of this because I don't need this for this next part. So I'm going to name the elements of my list like I would for a vector. And now I can see that my list has names. So to access elements of a list, you can use this double bracket notation. We talked before about why you would have to do this as opposed to the single bracket brackets that you use for vectors. Um, I want to ask just a really quick question. Uh, so because I think you guys probably pretty well understand this at this point, um, can anyone tell me how I would get this right here, the, um, the third element of the vector in my list? Just so you can see the list here. Can anyone would tell me how I would return this value right here? Uh, 
Okay, so a lot of a lot of right answers. Very good. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's right. That the, there's actually several ways you can do it, but the first thing you have to do is you have to access this data. And so you can do that a few ways. You can do that by doing my list. Whoops, my list four. And now that's going to give me access to the vector. And then I can add on top of that, I can add three. So now I'm getting within this vector that I've gotten here, I'm getting the third element. Yeah. So I've got that now. The other way I can do it is I can, just like some people have shown here, I can do the dollar sign notation. Uh, grabbing element four if it's a named list and then getting again the third element. Does anybody have any questions about how I did that? Okay. So um, I'm just going to very briefly cover matrices and factors. Hopefully you guys have gone through the introductory course in DataCamp at this point, so you've got an idea of how these work. But um, they're quite similar in many ways to the data frame and the uh, vector. But for a matrix, you can actually define it using a vector. So this is my vector from 1 to 10. And I can say here the number of rows is 2 and the number of columns is 5. So by doing this, I can build a matrix. And you'll see it here. It's a matrix from 1 to 10 with two rows and five columns, just like I specified up here. N row equals 2, two rows. N call equals 5, five columns. So just like with a data frame, a matrix has uh, row names and column names. So I can set my column names and my row names, and I can see that those have been added. And just like with a data frame, you can access the data using uh, numeric indexes or indices, or you can use the row names and column names. Okay. Factors are a bit unusual, and I don't really understand why R has them. I don't really use them very often, um, but I'll just say in this particular case what a factor is, and uh, at least some of the things you can do with them. So a factor can be created by taking a vector and then using it within the factor function or the factor, R, uh, the factor command. And so I can see here, I've just created a factor and I'll print it. So it's got my data, this is my, my vector, but it's now added this one extra level of detail, which is it's got uh, levels, and that's what a factor is. It's, it's a vector that's got factor levels. So the levels are 0, 60, 70, 80, and 90. Uh, so just like with um, a vector, factors can have names. So I'm going to add some names here. So now I've got my, my names and I've still got my levels. Uh, factors can be accessed the same way as vectors. So I return my 90 and it's got the name A. The other thing that happens when you return an element of a factor is that it will return all the levels from that factor with that element. Um, so this would be another way to access the factor. So I've accessed it by the name D. And then, uh, you know, there's reasons to use these levels. Uh, I've never really found many, but there are reasons. Um, and so one of the things that you can do if you, if you ever find yourself wanting to use these levels is using the levels command to get the levels of a factor and even to set them to something else. So right now my levels are zero through 90, but I want to set them from, to be 90 through zero, so I can reset my levels doing this. And now I can see that my levels are 90 through zero instead of zero through 90. All right, so that's it for the introductory concepts. Um, before I go on to the intermediate ones, does anybody have any questions? Why did you not have to state a by row? So you can state by row if you want to. Um, so I'll just show you what would have happened if I had done that here.
So um, don't remember what it was like before. So let's say this is false. If I don't have by row, you can see what it did was it went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and that's because it's going by column, right? And then if I say by row is equal to true, now it's across the rows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that's because it fills out the rows in order first instead of filling out the columns in order. So no, it defaults to column first. Yeah, so um, by default, yeah, if you just do it without specifying, it does the columns first. So it does the columns first like this. But you can, you can force it to do the rows first. Uh, if you ever have any questions about this, um, a really great way to get help in R is just to type question mark and then the function that you're trying to understand. So question mark matrix, for example, will uh, show a little help page here in RStudio. And you can see here, this is the matrix function and this is showing all the arguments in that function. You can see that the default argument for by row is false. So by default, by row will be equal to false. And then you can even read about the different arguments down here. So um, by row, this will tell you what that argument does. Dim names, if you wanted to specify dim names, you could do that. Uh, and you can read about how to do that here. Um, so the, the help pages are quite useful, especially when you're first getting started with R. And all you have to do to access help pages is to type the question mark and then whatever command you're trying to get help with. Question mark dot data frame, for example, will pull up the help page for making a data frame. And we can see all of that information right here. Okay, were there any other questions? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go on to some intermediate concepts. Um, so I'm, I'm now thinking we'll probably get started with tidyverse next time, but that's okay. I mean, it's good to, to take our time, make sure we really understand these concepts before jumping into something more complex, you know? So, um, just make sure that if you haven't completed it already, that you're, you're getting to the point where you're completing the intermediate R course in data camp, because that's going to recap the same things I'm going to talk about here. And it's going to really get you prepared for the tidyverse lesson um, in which we're really going to, to dive in with the uh, data science side of using R. Okay, so let's talk about how to do some methods with complex data structures. So for example, we've got a numeric vector. It's got one, 10, and four. If I, uh, if I add one to that vector, it's going to add one to every element in the vector. So we can see here, my vector was one, 10, and four, and now it's, when I add one, it's two, 11, and five. So that's how addition by a scalar. So one is a scalar in R, or you know, a numeric. Addition by a single numeric, that's how that works in R. If I have a second numeric vector of the same length as the first one, then when I add them, it actually does vector addition. So it does pairwise addition. That means that for the first element, it's going to add the first element to vector one and the first element to vector two, the second element of vector one and the second element of vector two, and then you know so on and so forth for all the elements. So we can see that here, it's added one to 10, 10 to two and four to three to give us our results. It's the same way with multiplication. The point of this is that um, if your vectors, if you're trying to add two vectors and multiply two vectors or in some way work with two vectors, yeah, so McKenna, was, that's, a, that's exactly what I was about to say. Um, well, yeah, so like anything else, you know, try this yourself, see what happens. But yeah, I, I'll just show you here. So you get a, uh, a warning message, which actually I'm surprised it's not an error. That should probably be 
an error, but, oh, okay, I see. So it actually will still attempt to add them, it looks like. Um, so what did, it, what did it do? It complained at you. It said the longer object length is not a multiple of shorter object length. Basically what that means is that your vectors are not the same length. But it actually still gave you a result without throwing an error, which I was not expecting. So what did it do? Well, it went back and for this hanging element here, it actually uh, added it to the very first element. Yeah, exactly, it loops back. Yeah, it recycles the value. Which is like, I can't imagine a situation where that's really what the user intended, but hey, you never know, right? Okay, um, yeah, but my, my rec recommendation would be never try to do operations with vectors that are different lengths, unless you have a really good reason to do that. Um, all right, uh, so the same thing is true for these sort of Boolean or logical comparisons. So if I've got my vector here, if I ask the question vector one greater than one, so this is my element wise comparison, it returns to me a vector of the same length as my original vector, where it's going to say for each of the elements whether or not it was greater than one, right? So this first element is one, so obviously it's not greater than one, but 10 is greater than one, and four is greater than one. So this is the same thing as our, like our addition and multiplication and subtraction. It all, if, you're, if you're doing it against a scalar, it'll do it for every element against that scalar in the vector. And if you're doing it vector comparing to a vector, then hopefully they're the same length and it'll compare them pairwise. So let's see that here. So I've now got a second vector. I'm going to ask the question vector one greater than vector two. Oh, this should say greater than, but okay, well. Uh, and then we get false, true, true, and that's because vector two, uh, if we look here, we can see one, you know, is greater, uh, is not greater than 10, 10 is greater than two, and four is greater than three, which is why we get uh, false, true, true. Uh, is there an operator for vector multiplication division? Yes, so it works the same. I just, uh, yeah, I mean, this is vector multiplication right here. Um, and in fact, I, we, we're not, we're not going to talk about this today, but, uh, if, if any of you are familiar with linear algebra, you know that there's special operations for like, uh, yeah, so you can do a dot product. You can do, um, pretty much anything that, so in fact, in R, I think the, the dot, uh, I don't remember how to do dot product in R. Maybe, maybe, uh, Dr. Chen or Mupu remembers that one. Um, but okay, or cross, I let me think of like the cross product maybe. Yeah, you can do all those with R. Um, I just couldn't tell you off the top of my head how to do it since it's pretty rare for me to do anything like that myself. Um, but okay, hopefully that, that makes sense. Yeah. No, we can, we can talk, don't confuse them. That's too, okay. too confusion, yeah. So, all right. Um, so it's the same thing for the, the less than here and equivalence so none of the elements are equal which is why we get false 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 not equal will give true 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 because all the elements are not equal all right so let's talk about some some logical vectors now right so we've got true false true is a logical vector here and we can see not vector three so what is that going to do well it's going to negate every element of the vector so it's going to make it opposite of what it was before. So true becomes false, false becomes true, and true becomes false. So now we're getting back into our, our ands and our ors. So the way this works is pairwise, right? So it's going to compare this to this, this to this, and this to this using this and operator. Can anyone tell me what this will, what this will output? Okay, good, yeah. So it's, it's, in fact, it's going to be false, false, true. 
Exactly. What about the OR operator? Okay, good. Yeah, exactly. It'll give true, true, true. That's because all you need is for one of these to be true for the whole thing to be true. One of these has to be true. One of these has to be true. And each of these contains at least one true. So, um, All right. So we can actually use characters for a lot of these comparisons as well. So if I've got a character vector here, vector 5, and I ask, is it equal, equivalent to hello? It says true, false, false. Well, that's because the first element was hello, but the other two aren't. I can make another character vector, vector six, and then ask if these vectors are equivalent. And it says false, true, true. It's because hello and aloha are different, but world and exclamation point are the same. False, true, true. Okay. Oof. Next, uh, I don't think we covered this in the first one, but I really, I use in all the time, the in operator. As probably one of the uh, operators in R I use the most. And it asks the question, if a particular value is contained within a vector. And so now we're asking here, is 11 in one through 10? And I'm sure you can already guess it's not, so this will give false. But 5 in 1 through 10 is true, because obviously 5 is in the vector of 1 through 10. We can also ask here if true is in true, false, false. And well, we see it right there, so we know it is. So that's true. Um, we're asking is hello in hello world exclamation point, and we know it is, so that one's pretty easy. Uh, can anyone tell me what this one will give me? And you guys are fast. <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, it's true, and it's because by itself, this will be false, but then we negate it, so now it becomes true. True. All right, now, when I, when I make this comparison here, it will output a Boolean vector, or a, sorry, a logical vector. Boolean and logical basically mean the same thing. It'll output a logical vector, and we can see false, 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 true. And that's because we've asked the question here, 1 through 10, which of these is equal to 5, right? Which of them is equal to 5? Well, we say the first one's false, second one, third one, fourth one, all false, but 5 obviously is true because 5 is equal to 5. Well, there's actually a simpler way to do this, and that's to use the which command. Now, the which will take a, a Boolean or logical vector, and it will return the elements of that vector which are true. So it returns to me 5 because it's the fifth element of this vector, this Boolean vector, which is true. Length function is another great vector function. So length will really just tell you how long is a vector. So my vector is, is length 5 here. It's 1 through 5. That's 5 elements. And so if I say length of my vec, it gives me 5 because that's the number of elements in my vector. A, an extremely useful function for vectors also is a sample. So what sample is going to do is it's going to randomly choose elements from, the, from your vector. So in this particular case, I've got a vector of 1 through 100. That's my vec. And then I say I want to sample my vec, and I want to choose 10 random elements from that vector. And so now it's chosen for me 10 random numbers from my vector. Pretty nice. Okay, so 
Now let's talk about some really nice mathematical operators for vectors. So I've got a list of numbers here. You can see it here. Let's say I want to know the max value in my list, or sorry, in my vector. I want to know what is the largest number in my vector. Well, I can run max of my nums, and that will return the highest value, which is 100. Min is a function that gives the lowest value, so 1.5. Mean calculates the average of all the elements in my vector, 22.33 something, yeah. Median gives the median, 4.5. And sum adds up all of the elements in the vector together, so it's a summation. SD. That's the standard deviation. So 38.65 something. So while we're probably not gonna use a lot of these at first, you'll find that these are extremely valuable for a, a huge amount of what you'll be doing in R. Because there is there's so many times where it's just really important to be able to do these sort of quick uh, vector calculations. All right, does anybody have any questions before I go on to if else logic? Okay, so if statements, if statements are going to evaluate a logical condition. In this particular case, I'm evaluating the condition i is greater than five. Well, we know that that's true. So if, if this is actually true, right, then it's going to execute the code between the brackets. So basically what this means is if my logical condition evaluates to true, then do all this stuff, do all the stuff between these brackets. So that's what it did. Because I was 10, here, I'm just gonna, you don't even need that. Uh, it printed out my statement. But let's say i is 4. Now we know that i is not greater than 5. So what will happen here, right? It's not going to do anything because the condition was not met. All right. Now, there's another thing that you can add to an if-else statement or to an if statement called an else. Now, an else is going to uh, activate if the conditions above were not met. So in this particular case, we know that i is not greater than 5 because i is 4, which means that it will not activate this condition. It will not run this code. But because I have an else, then now it's able to run this code because this code gets triggered when the above logical comparison returns false. And we can see here that it did, in fact, run our else statement. All right. Now, another thing to keep in mind. Um, uh, another thing to keep in mind is that this goes in order. So it's going to do this part first and then this part. If this part ends up being true, it's never going to get here. This is important when you're talking about if, else if, else statements. So in this particular case, I'm asking the question, is i greater than zero? And if that's true, then it'll print this statement. Except, else, if i is equal to zero, then it'll print this statement. And then if none of these conditions are met, then it'll print this statement. Um, so, so some people are asking about paste. Paste is a function. I'm just going to show you what it does. Paste takes in, um, does it take a vector? Oh, I always forget this stuff. Oh yeah, it does. All right. So it doesn't take a vector. It just takes words. 
So basically, paste is going to take two characters and push them together with the space in between. Yeah, I mean, you can also include non-strings. So I guess if I put a one in here, if I put a true in here, it will get converted to a character before the pasting completes. Um, so hopefully that kind of makes sense, how paste works. Um, the other cool thing that you can do with paste is you can add what's called a separator. So if I wanted to separate these two terms by a comma instead of a space, I could do that. So I've added my separator and now it's separated them by a comma. Anyways, I don't want to get, uh, this is going to get complicated pretty fast. I don't want to get too far into that. Uh, but that's what paste is for. Alrighty. So uh, the else if only activates if this was false and if this condition is met. If it's not met and if this is false, if both of these are false, then you go on to your else. In this case, we go, we hit this first condition, it's true, we say i is positive. If i was negative 55, well, it'll go all the way through to the bottom because it won't meet this condition and it won't meet this condition. So it'll get all the way here to the else. Then of course, if i is zero, it'll fail to meet this condition, but it will meet this condition. So it will print i is zero. So that's if else. Right, um, so let's talk about loops. Let's say I've got some days of the week, Monday through Sunday. One way to do a loop is called a for loop. And here I'm saying for day in days of week. Basically what I'm doing is I'm looping through all the elements of my vector. So I'm going all the way through the week. And then I'm taking from that one at a time each of the elements of the vector. And I'm assigning it to the variable day. So on Monday, the day is going to be equal to Monday. And then it's going to print Monday and then so on and so forth with every subsequent day. So you can see that's what it did. It, it looped through, and this is why we call it a loop. It looped through the vector, assigning each element in turn to day, and then printing it. That's the, they call this in data camp, I think the type one way of doing a for loop. There's also the type two way, which is to use a, um, a numeric index instead of doing it like this. So instead of that, I could do i in one through the length of days of the week. The truth is that this is actually the same thing here. It's not, it's not really special or different. It's just that instead of using um, directly calling individual elements of the vector, the original vector, I'm actually making a new vector that's the same length as the original vector. So I'm making a new vector here, same length as the original vector, and I'm setting i to be in turn each of these numbers. Now these numbers correspond to my original vector, so I can use them to pull out of my original vector the day that I want. So you can see it, it outputs the same thing. Poor type. No, so it gets created automatically within the for loop. So when, when you go through the for loop, um, you're going through this vector, days of the week, you hit the first element of the vector, day gets assigned to the first element, it prints. Next element of the vector, day gets assigned, prints, so on and so forth. So it's automatically assigning day in the for loop. Every time you go through every new element of the vector, day is getting assigned to it, and then it's it's executing the code in here. No problem. Uh, I don't use while loops. I don't know anyone who uses while loops. I, I've, I can count on one hand the number of times in my life I've used a while loop, um, and they've all been in coding classes. 
So <laughs> I'll show you how they work, but I, I mean, I'm not going to stress them. Um, so I, if, if right here I say, all right, x is equal to 5, I say, well, x is greater than 0, so it's a logical condition. So x is right now, because it's 5, it's greater than 0. I'm going to do something. I'm going to print x, and then I'm going to assign x back to itself, but with one number locked off. So the first time through, it's going to knock off a number. It's going to be a 4, then it's going to be a 3, then it's going to be a 2, then it's going to be a 1. And then by the time uh, it knocks off this last number, x will be 0, and then this, this will evaluate the false, so it won't run anymore. I just don't know what the advantage over a for loop is, to be honest with you. But, okay. So that's exactly what it did here. It did 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And that's because it kept going through the loop, kept diminishing the value of x until this was no longer true. And we can see now, if I look at x now, it's 0. And we can see that this condition here is false. All right. So um, I made a little uh, if else here to show off kind of how you can combine for loops and if else statements. So I'm going to go through this days of the week and I'm going to um, <laughs> actually I want you guys to run this and put in the chat what this what this outputs. Yeah, no parties today. <laughs> All right, so Carlo posted it. Um, yeah, let me know if you guys are having trouble uh, getting any of this, because um, yeah, I think the box folder idea has been pretty good so far, but I think some people have had a hard time accessing it. Um, so, like, send it an email if you're having a hard time getting to any of the uh, code examples. But Okay, so what is it doing? It's looping through the days of the week. It's printing the day. If the day is Saturday, then we say party time. If the day is Monday, then we say I hate Mondays. And then if neither of these things are true, if it's not Saturday or Monday, we're going to print no, no parties today. Which is it's kind of whimsical, I guess. Um, so we can see here, Monday, I hate Mondays. Tuesday, no parties, you know, all the way to Saturday, party time. And then Sunday, no parties. So we're pretty far from the next party at this point. Finally, um, Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there's literally a switch statement. Yeah, there's literally the switch function in R. So, so check out switch. Oh god, check out switch and uh, see if you can figure out how to use it. I've never figured out how to use it, but I bet it's probably not you know too terrible. All right, so the next section is functions. Or actually, I should say this is probably the well, no, second to last section. I'm gonna try to wrap this up pretty fast though. Sex, uh, next section is functions. Um, functions take an input and perform an operation. So this function that I've defined here takes an input number and then it will perform an operation. It prints your number is and then it will print the number. So like everything else in R, uh, functions are objects in R. So I have saved my object my function object to the variable my funct, and then I use my funct on the number 100, which prints back for me your number is 100. Um, 
So then the next function, I called this one random picker. It's going to take a vector, and then it's going to sample that vector, choosing one element from it, and it's going to return that element. So why do we use return statements? Well, sometimes you want your function not just to do something, but to provide you back an output. So it's got an input. This is our output in the return. So if I, if I say, you know, if I make my random picker function, and then I call it on days of the week, it's going to pick a random day of the week. Pick Sunday. If I run it again, it'll pick another day, so on and so forth. And if you guys remember, basically what I'm saying here is I'm sampling my days of the week and I'm choosing only one element from days of the week randomly and I'm returning that. All right, uh, last but not least is the apply family. Um, apply family functions are a way of taking a, a function, so a function that you define and applying it to every element of either a vector or a list or a matrix, uh, whatever you want. Uh, the difference between S apply and L apply and just run of the mill apply is what the output is going to be. So S apply is going to return a vector. L apply is going to return a list. And normal old apply is going to return a matrix. Um, so in this particular case, this is our if if this is our if statement from before, and we're going to go through every day of the week, and we're going to check if it's Saturday or if it's Monday. Um, we're going to talk about whether or not there's going to be a party, or if we hate that day, um, assigning the correct number of frowny faces, and then we're going to save the results of this in a vector. So let's take a look here. So we can see that's exactly what it did. It went through every day of the week. It completed the if else statement, and then it returned the appropriate character response for that day of the week. So Pragya, this is, this is actually an anonymous function. So this is an anonymous function because it's not being assigned to a variable. So if instead we assign this to a variable, my function, then now it's not anonymous anymore because it's got a name. And then we could just substitute this with function equals my function. It'll do the same thing, it's just it's not anonymous anymore. I don't really, um, I don't think there's really any advantage to doing it either way. I don't think ours, Python's different from R in that I think uh, in Python maybe the anonymous functions are probably uh, more useful. Uh, but I might just not know, I don't really use them all that much. So, okay, L apply, we're gonna do the exact same thing, but we're going to return it as a list instead of as a vector. So pretty, pretty simple. Um, the only difference now is that we don't have the days of the week as the names like we did before. And that's just an intricacy of L apply. Um, there's actually a way to get around that, which is just to take, there's actually a couple ways to get around that. But uh, the easiest way is probably just to reassign the names of your output as your you know, days of the week. And then now it'll have the appropriate names. So you can see that here. Finally, uh, we're going to talk about apply. And I've got one minute. So I make my matrix. And I can see it here. This is my matrix, just like before. Apply is going to perform a function on either the rows or the columns or both of that matrix. The way you specify whether it's rows or columns or both is by this margin argument. So if I set margin equal to 1 to 2, then that means it's going to apply the function to both the rows and the columns. But that's actually another way of thinking about that is it's going to apply the function to every single element of the matrix. So basically, that means that every number in my matrix is going to be put into this function. 
And in this function, I'm saying if the number is greater than five, I return true. If it's not, then I return false. So let's take a look at the output. So I can see here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's kind of exactly what you would have expected. Um, but let's say that instead of applying a function to every element of a matrix, I want to apply it across the columns or across the rows. Well, to apply it across the columns, I would specify margin is two because in in apply family, you know, speak two is columns and one is rows. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm taking the matrix, I'm taking all the columns of the matrix, and then I'm returning the sum of that column. So basically we can already see here in our, our original, you know, my mat. So that's going to take the sum of one and two, the sum of three and four, the sum of five and six, the sum of seven and eight, the sum of nine and 10. It's going to return it to us. And we can see here that's in fact what it has done. And then of course we can do the same thing, but instead we can specify the row. So we put margin is one to specify that we want to return the sum across the rows. So that should calculate the, uh, the addition of all these and the addition of all these. And that's exactly what it did. So I think uh, apply is probably the most confusing part of all of this. Um, but just in general, before we break, do you guys have any last questions or, or anything else that you'd like me to quick up, uh, clearly, uh, quickly clear up, gosh, uh, before we move on to Tidyverse next time? Okay, well, I hope this has been uh, really helpful. Um, like, I, like I said before, the most important thing that you can be doing um, is finishing the introduction to, or sorry, finishing the intermediate R and getting started with Tidyverse. So um, regarding uh, uh, Yi's question, so what you'll want to do is you'll want to uh, do that probably sometime around October, probably late October, because we're not going to need that until the, um, the very last portion of the course where we're going to be actually working in, in Shell. So you can finish it, you can get an early start. Uh, you know, I, I don't discourage you, but uh, I would definitely focus for right now, I'd focus on making sure that you finished um, the intermediate R that you have, if you can, finish Tidyverse uh, before next time, but it's all right if you can't. Uh, it would just be, it would probably help you out if you at least started it. And getting started with the RNA-seq with Bioconductor course in uh, Data Camp if you finished all the other things. Right, yeah, it's going to look pretty different because it's going to be a terminal. So, um, oh, I, I just realized that, uh, there isn't a terminal in Windows, but I was about to try to show you one. But uh, if you like Google online or if you've got a Mac, you know what a terminal looks like. Uh, if you Google online, uh, shell terminal, you'll see what it looks like. But basically it's, it's a little bit different from what we've seen so far. Not too dissimilar, dissimilar from the R console, but um, certainly it's going to require some skills that you have not yet developed. But hopefully we'll, it won't be too complicated by the time we get there. Okay, um, and don't forget, if you have finished the intermediate R course, uh, go ahead and do that R programming assessment uh, and also do the week two practice problems and make sure you send those to me when you finish them um, so that I can send you the solutions and so I can just make sure that you're on the right track. But yeah, um, okay, if there are no other questions, then thank you all so much uh, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.